Okay, the other nine concepts, and this, this will be really quick. They're all really super important, but they're all super discreet and uh, totally uncontroversial. Here we go, you ready? Concept number two. Airway pressures are high in asthma and bronchospasm and anaphylaxis. 50 to 100 centimetres of water, super high. Some case reports up to 120. LMA start leaking at 25 centimetres. It is unknown how long you can bag and mask somebody with these high pressures. The path of least resistance will be to the esophagus. We know in paediatrics we inflate stomachs. It will inevitably fail through uh, hypoxia or through stomach inflation and aspiration, but it will inevitably fail. And we've got two cases here that demonstrate that perfectly. An endotracheal tube with an inflated cuff is the only effective method of oxygenating an arrested asthma or anaphylaxis patient, full stop. It's not controversial. I've discussed it with multiple intensivists, colleagues, uh, and I think we all agree that that's the case. Concept number two. Immediately securing the airway with an endotracheal tube has multiple other benefits. Preventing aspiration is super important. Vomiting is common in anaphylaxis. Any aspiration in a bronchospasm and reactive airways is catastrophic and will make your life miserable in terms of ventilation afterwards. Um, and it's critical to avoid that. that. That is really important to avoid aspiration. So G unconscious patient with asthma or anaphylaxis, that tube goes in to protect their airway. But if it's anaphylaxis and you don't know where, what's happening to the airway because they, uh, it's, it's thing, things evolve very quickly, right? Um, and progressive airway edema happens. And what it might be an easy tube at the beginning becomes a hard tube 10 minutes later. Concept four. The first attempt should be the best attempt. Muscle relaxant should be in the resuscitation trolley of every ED. There should be a video laryngoscope ready to go. And it should be the best intubator in the room. Not the hospital, the best intubator in the room. We don't have time to wait for anaesthetics or intensivists or whatever happens in your place. Um, this is core emergency medicine and it's the best intubator in the room. Sedation and waiting for sedation should not delay your intubation. It will come. We'll get the tube in first. We only need two drugs, adrenaline and rocuronium or succimethonium if you still use it. But you only need two drugs. It, it takes time to, to, get, uh, to get the sedation or midazolam or ketamine or whatever you use. Uh, it, it takes time. So we don't have that time to wait, but it will come in, in a few minutes. Concept five. An inability to intubate on the first best attempt becomes a kicko until proven otherwise. Can't intubate, can't oxygenate. That means the surgical airway follows immediately. One attempt, then surgical airway. Should happen within four minutes. Concept six. What other cognitive pushes do you need to go and do this heroic thing that actually you're pretty comfortable with because you're an awesome emergency physician? No unconscious patient arrested from asthma and anaphylaxis is going to magically wake up. Now, I know there will be an exception to this, room if it's straight, to, to this rule if it's a straight asthma case and they're still breathing and you give them some iron adrenaline and bag them up and maybe you can get away with it if it's a little one. With that. There might be an exception, but in the adolescence and the anaphylaxis cases, uh, they're, they're not waking up. This is a hypoxic arrest. Uh, crack on. Like, you, you, you can delay things until they have brain damage but you, you should, you, this is your cognitive push to go ahead. You have permission. I'm giving you permission. Concept seven, intubation practice. We need to be practiced at doing emergency intubations. It's just something that we do because that's what we do in our department. We can do an emergency tube. It's no problems. Arresting patients, they're time, criti time critical intubations to avoid catastrophe. There's no checklist. Uh, we don't delay the time critical intervention and it relies on mini sims, in situ sims, pre-practice, there's no formal checklist. In awake patients who are intubating in the emergency department, they're awake. We've got everything to lose here. It's about optimising checklists, 
doing everything in every way possible to avoid catastrophe when we put them to sleep and give them induction drugs. In a myocarditis patient, cardiomyopathy patient, that might include having ECMO almost plumbed and the wires in on induction. Checklists are good. Now, I've given this talk a few times and some trainees want a t-shirt and the t-shirt uh, they want is they saying on this side, if, if they are dying, save their life. Go ahead. <laughs> but if they're awake, don't kill them. Um, I don't know if we'll get those t-shirts made up, but, but you need to understand that concept. You've got nothing to lose on this side. You've got, uh, you're, you're only going to lose by delaying. Uh, on, on this side, you've got everything to lose by not being prepared. Concept eight, uh, pneumothorax rates in positive pressure ventilation patients in ICU are low. Pneumothorax rates are high if there's CPR or arrest involved. If things aren't improving or deteriorating, you really need to think about it. And if things really are going badly, then you decompress. And when I say going badly, I mean like still SATs in the 40s or, you know, or bradycardia. It's difficult to diagnose an ultrasound and supine chest x-rays. Um, in the heat of the moment. So um, it's, it's something that you need to, uh, need to be considering. Now, concept nine is extreme ventilation. Now, asthma patients, once you get the tube in, you, uh, you, you can't relax like other patients. You've still got a lot of work to do. And that means implementing medical therapy for the bronchospasm, but it also means doing some really uh, awesome ventilation. And so it's going to feel tight. It's going to feel like a brick, but you need to deliver something. So yes, you do have to squeeze that bag hard, but you're only going to deliver small breaths. If you could use a bag, not a ventilator at the beginning until things are out of control, uh, under control, because setting a ventilator to have pips of 100 is really hard. Um, you, you need to get things under, get a feel for things with a bag and mask first. We don't want a breath stack. You want to make sure they fully expire. If things are really uh, you know, bad and at the beginning, you can do the lateral chest squeeze. Uh, so you can deliver the breath, lateral chest squeeze, um, then give another breath. Um, certainly that's what I did for Max uh, and it worked. Um, you know, there's multiple case reports of it working. Uh, it, it's another cognitive aid to stop your breath stacking and getting too excited so that you're pausing between breaths to do something. Um, and so it, it, I think it can be useful even if it's just a cognitive aid. And lastly, concept 10 um, is extra medical therapy. So this is where uh, you, you've used your two emergency drugs and you're asking for all the more drugs to come to help this bronchospasm or this low blood pressure. And for the bronchospasm, that's adrenaline, um, it's bronchodilators, I would use subbutamol uh, IV as a load, um, say for an adult 250 micrograms, um, you could give some ipratropium in the circuit. Um, I wouldn't be scared of magnesium, even though it vasodilates and puts blood pressure down. If I'm on an adrenaline infusion and my blood pressure was under control, I would give the magnesium quite quickly, like over 10 minutes. Um, you know, it's supposed to be over 20. Um, I would use ketamine as my sedation and steroids, of course. With the blood pressure, it's easy. Some fluids, some adrenaline, some noradrenaline, some vasopressin. We just keep escalating uh, and, until the blood pressure is uh, perfusing. So that's concept 10. So that's, that, that's it. So if we put all of those concepts together, um, it ends up in being this uh, a, a max four situation. It ends up being a, a max four algorithm. And again, the four minutes is the crucial point. But, um, but, but it's all based on science uh, from first principles. There's nothing controversial or new here. Um, it's just giving you a structured approach. Um, so just to recap what it is, it's adrenaline, um, one microgram per kilogram as an IV bolus that can be over 30 seconds or every minute, um, or as things improve, uh, you know, you space it out more while the adrenaline infusion is coming. It usually takes about 10 minutes for the adrenaline infusion to get drawn up. Um, it, it's uh, involves the muscle relaxant because our first attempt, we're only doing one attempt, so the first attempt has to be the best attempt. Um, I appreciate that if someone's asystolic and got no tone, that's fine, you don't need the muscle relaxant, but um, it, you're, you're hoping that you do and you, you should use it. You have complete permission to use it uh, on arrival if there's IV access. Um, you'll need some intraosseous, uh, you, you need some pretty rapid IV access. 
airways, the ETT, as we discussed, and all the extras and extreme ventilation, but remember, it's all about the four minutes. So that's a max four. That, that, it's actually a really good algorithm. Um, it gives you some structure, and the key is, again, maximum four minutes. And, and, and just uh, to remind you that the, the top line is the indication. If unconscious needing assisted ventilation from asthma or anaphylaxis, um, then, then it, it's a good algorithm. <coughs> 